Um, we're back now with, uh, this is part seven of eight um, on uh, an introduction to general federalism, which is the document that we're sort of going over. Um, the uh, video series titled, uh, title is um, World Government and General Federalism. So part seven is a continuation of part six, which was um, casting economics as an object of the social contract. And in the last part, we developed some uh, equations for financial economics um, that are you know, just basically pretty simple um, canonical type equations that just kind of um, show and illustrate what happens if you apply general equity to, um, to economics. So um, having wrapped that up now, um, this one will, pro this will probably be pretty short. We're just going to um, kind of um, tie up some loose ends uh, on, this, on this topic discuss a few things and um, <clears throat> after this um, um, we'll talk about uh, in part eight I think we talk about um, uh, sovereignty and the issues that that, that creates um, and uh, zero zero banking which is is you know closely related to financial economics but it's a part of it I guess um, it's basically it's the monetary uh, a monetary system um, zero zero banking um, so anyway um, so we'll just pick up where we left off. Uh, we had, um, you know, um, basically figured out how to calculate um, um, compensation, remuneration, um, using general equity um, in an economy like this, um, and based on, you know, um, wealth in a public trust. So um, I'll just start reading again and provide my commentary as usual, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So. Um, a fiducial economy takes the approach of exposing the least amount of economic activity necessary to expose the economy to rule of law. That is the basic program of fiducial economics. As we saw above, applying in the previous section, applying valuable consideration as a tool of exposure, we found that one is already exposed in any economy already using currency, but the other two, generally speaking, are not. The application of valuable consideration now gives us a straightforward formula. A fiducial economy is one in which the global community, a uh, global constituency having equal suffrage, decides what it wants to produce from the natural resources it shares and how much of that to produce. And an important distinction here to make is that it, the, what, what's being decided, and when I say decided, we're, talking, we're really talking about um, you know, uh, this whole idea of planned economies, but what this is is not fiducial economics is not a planned economy because the entire economy is not planned. Um, however, what is produced in that first uh, stage of production? So we, we were talking earlier about these these you know in the simple case you know these this string of factories um, um, involved in a production run of a particular product, which we call it a widget. Um, so in fiducial economics, where decisions are actually being made about economics, where there's actual genuine planning or something you could call planning is in that first stage that uh, F sub zero G sub zero H sub zero um, that, that um, initial factory that, that, that takes the initial raw materials and uh, natural resources and begins to work them it's at that stage where um, some planning can be done and we talked about this in another section but basically in the um, in the Soviet Union and the PRC and all these countries that have been studied. What's been found is that that, and that's really a tiny fraction of the overall planning that goes on in a traditional uh, planned economy, but that particular sliver, that slice, that, that fraction of the planning um, is the one area of planning that actually did work well in those economies. Um, the rest of it uh, it's arguably was a disaster, um, but um, the one part that did work well was that initial planning. Um, and we talked about optimization resource optimization and this does allow that um, so what this is saying is is that um, they're, they're through equal suffrage and by having a global constituency uh, in fiducial economics you can plan at least the, the the way in which you know how much of a natural resource is used um, and in what ways it's used and also you know um, you can address some ecological issues because you're at the head end or the front end of that and you can make decisions about that once you start producing uh, materials um, for 
um, productive capital to be used in other other roles or other uh, applications to then develop products after that. So it's a sort of a chain of production. But once you produce those initial um, products, uh, the rest, the, the, you know, there's no planning involved. It's all based on valuable consideration. There's no state planning where the state says, oh, um, you know, we're, we're just going to take the resources from this factory and transfer them to that factory because that's what the state planner said. No valuable consideration, nothing, you know. Um, no decisions being made freely in the marketplace about um, what, you know, what a factory may use or who, who they may um, 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 patronize as far as, you know, obtaining what they need. That, that is all just up to the, you know, the, um, the leadership and the organizations to decide that. Um, there, there's no planning there. But again, at the first level, as far as the natural resources are concerned, that can be planned. Um, and uh, that makes a huge difference. It solves a lot of the problems that we brought up and um, why new ideas are needed and uh, why global rule of law. Um, it addresses a lot of those problems. So that's what the, that's what that was talking about. Very briefly, um, it just kind of condensed it there real quick. But uh, so it goes on to say they then assign or reach an agreement amongst themselves and candidates on who will be the fiduciary responsible for the best use of those natural resources. The capital utilized at the first step of the production chain. What I was just saying. In this sense, the fiduciary becomes an entrepreneur who may stand to profit, but who still acts on behalf of the community, and therefore does not own the capital. He or she merely makes the best use of it. They are entrusted with the capital to do so. So this goes back to our earlier conversation about what does a community do when it has natural resources and there's division of labor and people depend on those natural resources. And this is sort of a, you know, expanding on that. The term entrepreneur, um, I think, was borrowed actually from the PRC. That, that was a term that was used, I think, I don't know if it originated there, but it was, it, it's been used there before to refer to, um, you know, um, businesses in, in the PRC. They, they call them entrepreneurs, but um, basically it's the same thing as an entrepreneur. The only difference is is that the you know you don't have a bunch of investors holding a title to the business. That's really the only difference. Um, it, it's really a technicality, really, uh, because the entrepreneur, the officers of the company, are making all the decisions about the company. It's their company. They're running it, and so it's not really much different. Um, it's simply the legal character of that organization. As an organization, it is it belongs to the public. It's in the public trust. Um, that's really the only difference. So um, anyway, um, having said that, um, it goes on to say, let's see where where were we? Yeah. So once this decision is made, the community leaves the rest in the hands of the fiduciaries. So, no, there is no Soviet-style economics going on here, as I was saying. Factories buy goods from other factories through normal valuable consideration using currency, like I said. Consumers do the same, and there is no price fixing. So, at the consumer end of that production chain, there's no price fixing. So, no, no one's planning the prices either. In fact, it's very clear, uh, that's made, that point's made very clear in the Constitution, that um, you know, all, uh, all economic exchange in, in the Federation occurs through valuable consideration between you know, private individuals. Individuals are doing that. There's no, there's no planning of that. Um, <clears throat> so this, this is really very different than anything that I've, that I've seen um, as far as an economic system. And, and it, inevitably it would be, right? Because um, th this, is, um, this entire economic scheme comes about as a result of applying general equity to economics. Um, and I don't, I've never heard of anyone actually explicitly doing that. Systematically and explicitly, so it's no surprise that it's that it's unique, um, and that there's nothing like it, or it never has been anyone. Um, the term fiduciary is used uh, uh, a lot, and it's used because it's central to the whole concept of an economy like this. What it, what it what it's saying is is that the entire economy is built on this notion of of um, the community entrusting responsibility for natural resources with individuals so that when they act, when they uh, run a business, they are using those natural resources in trust. You know, they're using it in, in, uh, in the confidence of the public. And in that sense, they are, they are uh, tr in the truest sense, they are fiduciaries. And 
everything else, you know, once you apply general equity at the beginning and you get to that point, um, you know, the next step is just to figure out the, um, you know, the way in which wealth is managed, and, and that's what we did with the equations. Um, but, you know, really everything comes out of that. Once you understand that you're talking about fiduciaries um, and everything's running off of, of a fiduciary type of relationship, everything else just kind of falls out. Um, so that, that's why the term is used so heavily, and that's why it's called fiducial economics. Um, so labor on the other end, uh, labor on the other end, as a junior fiduciary, must in a just manner be afforded the same rights and privileges of the fiduciary in terms of their relationship to this process. So the junior fiduciary is, in, is, is you know, again, it's everybody becomes a fiduciary. Um, the line worker we were talking about is a junior fiduciary because they're being entrusted with the natural resources of society. Um, granted, they are um, adhering their own labor in it, but they're still, they're still utilizing those natural resources that are held in trust by the, by the entire community. So, um, you know, and we explained how their, their, their wealth gets disentangled from that, but that private wealth. But, um, so they're, they're a junior fiduciary. They're a fiduciary too. Everyone's a fiduciary. And that's why, that's why that term's so used, because it's, it's ubiquitous throughout the economy. So, um, yeah, in terms of the relationship, the process, yeah. Therefore, all remuneration when exposed by valuable consideration to rule of law is payable on the basis of the individual laborer's financial productivity. That is, on the basis of their performance in the role of a fiduciary. And again, there, you know, there's, I've heard a lot of, um, you know, people's initial reaction is, oh my God, you know, they're, they're going to be paid according to their individual financial productivity. Um, and that scares some people. Um, but it's important to understand that um, the, the, the wording of this in the Constitution, and it's deliberate, um, was done in such a way so that you, you actually, um, in most cases, would end up with the uh, one tenth that we were talking about, uh, X being linear. Um, because it gives that power to the fiduciary. So what that means mathematically is that while it's being called individual financial productivity, in reality what it would redound to is um, really a, a mean, a team mean. So it's not really that you're, uh, in most cases, uh, that you would really likely be paid according to your own individual financial productivity. It would likely be a team uh, average. and. You know that that's never going to vary much from from a norm. Everyone is going to get a significant pay, um, and uh, we, we've done some numbers and looked at it. And it's you know three to five times more uh, on average than what you would see in terms of the minimum wage um, for you know um, fairly low productivity jobs, jobs that don't require a lot of um, you know the, where, where the product being sold is not that expensive, basically, um, <clears throat> and. Um, that wouldn't vary that much in, in a real world situation. Um, if someone's productivity were to fall off significantly, you know, they, they would get, they might get, you know, um, uh, you know, I don't know, um, pressured by the team to perform. Um, certainly, because everybody, everybody wants their pay to be higher. But um, in terms of it really varying that much, um, I think it's it's not really going to vary that much. Um, that you'd be looking at any. It would be extremely unusual, I think, if anyone were paid anywhere outside three to five times their minimum wage at the lowest at the lowest productivity level um, of employment. Um, so, you know, for example, um, um, just trying to think of a good example. Um, well, I mean, software is sold at a very high price. So, uh, people that work in the IT industry are paid uh, very high, I mean, a lot, um, relatively speaking, um, to someone who works at, say. Convenience store or something like that. So um, it, it's the it's the value or the price in the market of what's being produced that's going to drive that. Um, so if you work in the IT industry and your company's selling you know software for several million dollars, you know your pay might be a little higher than if you worked in a convenience store where the product or the, or the overall sales you know every month are, are much much lower. Um, an example I'm using of three to five times greater than the minimum wage. I'm talking about a convenience store. I'm not even talking about, you know, software company. And all of this follows from what we've been discussing, if you think about it, because the performance of an economy like this, you know, no, nobody wants to say, you know, wants to predict, you know, uh, project great things and, you know, make all these wild claims. But, you know, no matter how you slice it, when you look at it, um, clearly, unless, you know, unless there's just some, I don't know, some completely unknown variable. Um, th this 
this would be a much much stronger performer than even capos um, in the aggregate as well as um, on the individual level um, because of the lack of any um, interest and um, principal repayment uh, because of the fact that people are paid um, uh, basically in the, the wealth for the wealth that they're generating directly um, it's not getting siphoned off by banks to the tune of trillions um, so there's a massive incentive for people to work hard um, and to be productive and um, there's no skimming off the top this would be an incredibly powerful economy um, it's something unlike we've ever seen before I, I, I think and so um, it's not surprising that you know for a convenience store you know you can take your whatever you're whatever, if you work at a convenience store this is a great example because you can take what you're being paid there and um, you know, if it's the minimum wage or you know close to that, just take that and multiply it by three or you know say three, uh, and then add you know and add that on top of your minimum wage, and that's comparably what you'd be making in an economy like this. This was so astonishing, um, and, and the math backs it up. I mean, if you go look, if you go look at the math and look at how it works, it's it's um, um, pretty much um, inevitable that it would work that way. So um, you know, I, I don't know, but anyway. That's what it's talking about with the junior fiduciary, and that's what it's talking about here with the, you know, the idea that everyone is a fiduciary and um, everyone is, um, you know, being paid according, you know, is basically being paid for their for their uh, contribution to the appreciation of the uh, value of the public trust. So, um, yeah, yeah. There is uh, another matter to take up here, having to do with the difference uh, between time and labor. Anyone acting as a fiduciary is due compensation for the time they provide in acting as such. I mentioned that. Regardless of whether or not a best use or any use is in fact achieved. Therefore, in a fiducial economy, remuneration for all economic activity is by the sum of a minimum wage, quote minimum wage, paid for time given uh, and individual financial productivity. It's the sum of those two. Regardless of how such a scheme may strike us, uh, this is the only just way to compensate anyone. And that's what we've just been through with this general equity thing. That is the quote, right way to do it. We'll look at features that can be established uh, to eliminate some of the more common concerns heard when speaking of productivity and pay. And I already mentioned that, um, that uh, this sort of, um, I'm going to call it a loophole, but I mean this, this, this constitutional wording that allows for the House of the Fiduciary to just basically average most of them so that it's really, it's really a team productivity. Um, that's one of the mechanisms used. So it, it's up to the House of the Fiduciary, but given that there you know there's a constituency out there and there there's influence you know they're going to tend to move in that direction they're going to tend to evolve in that direction um, and, and just simply as a matter of efficiency and economy they're not going to want to you know have all these functions we were talking about for all these specific cases to figure out everyone you know exactly what everyone's making and then, you know in terms of productivity exactly what everyone's productivity is relative to everyone else's um, not likely to, to happen that's going to be avoided at all costs because no one likes complication. Uh, it's just easier that way. So, um, let's see. Um, give me a try. Yeah. So, uh, the thing about the um, the time given, what that's saying is, is that you're being paid just for the time. I mean, if an employer um, monopolizes your time uh, in such a way that you, you, you're not free to use that time um, uh, however you please, then uh, uh, general equity would say that you're, you're entitled to compensation solely for that alone. Forget about any productive work you do. <laughs> and that's, that's general equity. I mean, if you think about it, go back to the community and look at the, um, the arrangements and the agreements they make, um, you know, if you distill it and look at it cleanly, it's, it's obvious that that's true. So in general federalism, the calibration of this productivity pay scale is up to the house of the fiduciary to determine. Since for one thing, it must set the minimum wage. So we already said that, basically. We just talked about that. Ultimately, the exact connection between productivity and, quote, dollars is driven by a valuable consideration. And that's another thing. Uh, I talked about that, too. The difference between, you know, say, um, a software company and a convenience store um, in terms of, or, or just any, any two businesses where the monthly, you know, sales volume is just so different. Um, if there's a big difference between them, um, you're going to see big differences in pay because that's the nature of the beast. Um, so, because general federalism seeks to apply general equity throughout society, 
Matters of economics are treated of equal import to those of law. And general federalism calls for the creation of two, quote, legislative bodies, a house of the legislator and a house of the fiduciary. One legislates law, and the latter legislates in the limited economic realm the Constitution provides. And that goes back to what we were talking about, about that uh, area of economic planning. That's what they do. They come up with economic plans that are you know, limited to in the way that we discussed earlier. Um, taken together, they are called a parliament, which is also interchangeably referred to as a branch of government. Um, I, don't know, I don't know if everybody you know, has actually decided yet on what they're going to call a branch. I've heard it both ways. So, so the Parliament is considered a branch, but then the House of the Legislature and the House of the Fiduciary are also considered branches, so I don't know which way that's going to go. Anyway, because the decision to produce is a community decision, there is no need for traditional fractional reserve banking. And we get into that in Part 8 of 8, and we'll get into that in much more detail. But this was how zero zero banking came up. What this means is that anyone can make application to start a business. And if they and their, propose, uh, their proposal are sound, newly minted general federation currency up to the amount of the resulting capital value of the enterprise funds the startup. To understand why this is actuarially sound, it says here, please see the website, but we, we've actually covered part of the reason why that's actuarially sound. You can start with those formulas and look at that, but you need to see the zero zero banking portion to see the complete picture behind that and why that's actuarially sound. Um, there is no interest payment obligation, no principal repayment, etc. It will produce an explosive economy that never faces inflation or deflation. Um, it's also an economy that um, forbids speculation. That's another unique feature of it. Um, it's not unique, I mean, in you know, history. I mean, uh, socialist systems, Marxist systems don't, uh, well, I don't know. I don't think they use speculation anywhere in their economies. Um, but basically, there, there aren't any markets in this kind of economy. There's no um, you know, playing the markets. There's no speculation um, on future performance or any of this stuff. So, you yeah, know, there's no interest, there's no um, principal repayment, none of that stuff. Um, and that means that there's no inflation or deflation. Because currency is printed, um, and we'll, we'll see that in 8 of 8, but uh, currency is printed um, and pegged directly to its uh, associated wealth, um, directly, explicitly and directly. So it's impossible for there to be inflation or deflation. I mean, it's, it's matched in real time. Uh, inflation, or I mean, currency and wealth are matched real time. Um, it will produce it. Well, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Should the market value of the resultant enterprise, total capital worth, be less than that needed to fund the startup, a more complex actuarial approach can be used to overcome this. So if you want to start a business, you go um, and you uh, apply for a considerable bond. It's called a considerable bond. And the considerable bond is basically saying, um, I want to start a business. Here's my business plan. Here's my resume. Here's my credit score. Here's my whatever. Everything that you have to supply. And if your business plan is good, your business plan you're going to supply that. If all of that's good and the actuarial analysis says this is going to like, you know, take off and be wildly successful, then the, you, 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 there's the, basically the Federation does a print run. They print currency for that. <laughs> and uh, the currency, so what this is talking about is it's saying that the currency printed has to match the basically the immediate wealth generated as a result of that print run uh, and the business plan. So um, you know, if you start a business and you go out and you buy, you know, say you're starting a business to run tractor trailers um, um, across the country, whatever. Um, one of the things you might do at, with a print run in, in your business plan, and you'd be legally obligated to follow this, is that you, you would have you would have to go buy a bunch of trucks. So by buying those trucks, that is new wealth because someone had to go make those, someone had to manufacture them, and inherited labor had to go into those, and that's where the new wealth is coming from, and that's why the print run is justified. Um, much more about that, though, in, in Part 8. So, all resources, um, let's see, what's the capital worth here? Yeah. All resources, and in fact all commercial assets, are not owned by any one single person. They are owned by everyone collectively. We've talked about that. In a representative government, this is best achieved through a public trust, so that's the vehicle, where the house of the fiduciary is named as one of its fiduciaries, uh, the primary fiduciary. Um, so, the public trust is not the government. It is independent of the government. Its existence and form is, however, backed by the full faith and credit of that government's rule of law. And just to point out something, um, when we say it's, it's not government, it's independent of government, um, it is more independent of the government than the Federal Reserve is of the United States government. So, um, 
is, is simply a legal entity that's created in law, that's all. It's created by fundamental law. Um, it's just a legal entity, and the government has no, you know, uh, it has certain constitutional powers uh, with respect to it. But other than that, it has no, it has no control over it. It doesn't own it. It doesn't have anything beyond that. And those, those powers are quite limited. So, um, yeah, basically the things we've talked about. Um, that the House of the Fiduciary can do. Of course, all this begs the question hinted at when we began our numerical analysis of general equity. What would one do in an industry where numeric values for financial productivity or where the managerial relationships are not as clear-cut or naturally inscrutable or impractical to calculate or track? First, we point out that the vast majority of roles in a modern economy already have metrics in place for measuring individual financial productivity, even if not cast in that language. This is because businesses are keen on finding areas in which to, quote, cut the fat and want to know where their weak links are. But not all roles fall into that category. So the answer to the first part is that we allow, wherever not feasible, a peer-based assessment of performance, not unlike what goes on in most workplaces now. For the second part, we contend that if the managerial relations are not clear-cut, then it is not a good business practice and shouldn't exist. For any organization that is responsibly using community resources, there must be some defined way of understanding why and how anyone other than a direct producer can justify their job. Since a direct producer's productivity, at least in the presumptive sense, is self-evident. As a case in point, we can take the proverbial university professor. How is his or her individual financial productivity to be assessed? In this case, <clears throat> they don't even have line workers. The answer is that it would have to rely on more traditional means of assessing performance, such as student evaluations, evaluations by their immediate supervisors, department chairs, for example, evaluations from their respective academic peer organizations, and evaluations from their colleagues. Um, these are just you know, hypotheticals. Each organization would have to define in some meaningful way what it means to be financially productive. And it is a necessary fact that all roles in society that exist under capitalist systems must, in some way, for example, must in some way financially, uh, must be uh, in some way financially uh, productive. Um, that's not making any sense. Let me read that again. And it is a necessary fact that all roles in society that exist under capitalist systems must in some way provide financially productive results. Else the markets would eliminate them from the economy. Um, sort of. Even in the case of publicly funded institutions, as in our university example. A solid case can be made for the financial productivity these organizations provide society, even if only abstract. As stated, in those cases, it would be up to the organizations to provide these definitions and arguments and establish such connections concretely. And the House of the Fiduciary, or its agents, would have the power to consult and review on these matters, ensuring that every organization is able to make this connection uh, in a meaningful way. In a fiducial economy, the public trust is a non-governmental legal entity whose grantor is the citizens as a block and its beneficiaries are all citizens of the General Federation. The trustees are numerous. The most visible of that bunch are the trustees that are elected to each of the seats of the House, the fiduciary, uh, the fiduciaries. And it is these fiduciaries who are initially specified in the Constitution. But once such a public trust starts operating, every entrepreneur, the House of the fiduciary names, is also a trustee. So it's not kind of like officers in the military. The House of the fiduciary commissions entrepreneurs, official, I mean technically. Um, this is why the Constitution grants a limited power of appointment to the trustees of the House of the Fiduciary, but this power is non-transferable, maintains separation of powers, and keeps public trust out of government, so that they can name entrepreneurs as trustees over the portion of the trust for which they are clearly responsible. So that's how that's done. Contract law and the problem of intellectual property. This is one I don't like, and I'll tell you why when I'm done. But anyway, um, the issue of intellectual property was also uh, examined in detail. Um, under general equity. And uh, so he here's that analysis. Suppose a musician composes, performs, and records a song, which he or she would like to sell in valuable consideration in the marketplace. When the final product is recorded, it constitutes a very long string of zeros and ones in a defined order. These strings of zeros and ones are called bits. A song of typical length and quality will compress to a bit length of about 40 million bits. Due to the sheer size of that bit string, one could easily, quote, bit shift, or flip a, flip a handful of bits 
and change their value from either a 0 to a 1 or from a 1 to a 0. You only have two choices. It's binary. And the result would not be detectable to the human ear if the bits altered were just a handful, say 100 or so. So out of 40 million bits, if you just flipped 100 of them, it wouldn't be discernible by a human, uh, probably. In contract law, when one sells a product or service for which the transaction is by definition contractual, the terms of the contract must, be defi must define the object of the contract. In other words, when selling by contract, I must show that valuable consideration has occurred by not only showing that currency and a product or service were both considered, but in order to establish that, I must adequately define the items proffered for consideration. Because if you can't define the item that's been considered, then how can you define consideration? Um, it's kind of a, a chicken and the egg problem. Currency is well defined in law so that that isn't an issue. But the object over which one is contracting must also be well defined, sufficient to guarantee a court's unique identification uh, of the thing being contracted. This problem can be overlooked for the most part at the point of sale, since the party receiving the product, say a song, can simply accept that what is being received is, by definition, the object contracted. So the musician selling the song on the open market presents no difficulty or issue by itself. In fact, one does not even need a written contract since the terms of definitions are implied. But suppose the musician would like to sell the song, but with a contractual condition. The party receiving the song must, if they expose the bit sequence to any other individual or legal entity, pay the musician a set fee per such transaction. This is usually called a royalty or something like that. In this way, the musician can continue to profit from the artistic contribution he or she has made. There is good reason in fundamental law to support contracts of this nature, implied or explicit, exactly. By doing so, the government is encouraging artistic and technological innovation of all kinds as it places a profit incentive behind that work, exactly. But the question put before General Federalist is this. Is a contract of this kind meaningful? and legally enforceable in a system of genuine rule of law. So, um, actually I said general equity, but actually the problem here is, so there's two things that are huge in federal, general federalism, and that's rule of law and general equity. Um, the problem here with intellectual property actually falls in the area of rule of law, and uh, I remember that now, so we'll get into that. Rule of law, as we've seen in its definition, requires that laws be uniform and predictable, such that one can predict with clarity, for example, when and if they are in violation of law. In the case of the musician making the single point-of-sale transaction, both parties to the exchange can know with clarity, can know with clarity what to expect in terms of their legal rights, since by the act of transacting, the object is self-defined. But in the latter example, this clarity is lost. Suppose, for example, that the buyer signs this contract and then proceeds to start bit shifting, flipping bits in, say, 12 cases out of 40 million. Is he or she thence bound to the contract signed? Generally, a contract over a musical score would simply identify and define the score by musician name and the title of the piece. So the question stands, if we, quote, bit shift 12 digits, what does this mean? Of course, we are inclined to quickly assert that, come on, it's the same song, right? <laughs> and that's, that's a good argument. Uh, we can simply just assert this as a practical matter and move on, perhaps. But suppose in response to that objection, the buyer then flips 100 bits of data. Suppose we line up hundreds of witnesses who are allowed to listen to both versions of the song as many times as they like and ask them to identify which is which. Suppose they cannot. What then? Still the same song? Suppose the buyer flips a thousand bits of data and we repeat. What now? The problem we're attempting to illustrate here is not that these bits of these, these bit flips constitute a different object, not defined by the original contract, regardless of the number of bits flipped. So the problem we're attempting to illustrate here is not that these bit flips constitute a different object not defined by the original contract regardless of the number of bits flipped. Quite the contrary. What concerns general federalists about this is the issue of rule of law. In other words, it is not that we can be sure that the buyer has created a new object from an old one, which is thus not subject to the terms of the contract he or she signed. So let me read that again. 
In other words, it is not that we can be sure that the buyer has created a new object from an old one, which is thus not subject to the terms of the contract he or she signed. The problem is that it is inherently ambiguous, and we don't know at what point to assert that a new product exists. So that, that's the critical point. This odd condition exists only because the content over which we are contracting is itself nebulous, at least in any objectively measurable sense. So it can have artistic quality. That's not what it's saying. It's saying that in any objectively measurable sense, it's nebulous. It is, by definition, subjective material. In fact, all intellectual property fits this pattern. There simply is no way to uniquely identify intellectual property for use in contract law. Sure, we can make reasonable assumptions and simply allow for this impression, uh, imprecision as a practical matter. But that's not our point here. The point is that ambiguity in contract law is unpredictability in rule of law, and we reject it. Of course, many might react to this with some surprise, but keep in mind that we are, as a society, conditioned to accept this notion of royalty payment for subjective material for one simple artificial reason. Prior to the what, and this is important, this is why most people like react to this like, what? Um, the reason is, prior to the widespread introdu introduction of computers in society and the internet work, almost all subjective material was intrinsically bound to a physical medium. This meant that contract law could operate with predictability by de facto contracting over the physical media upon which subjective material was inhered. And as far as radio stations were concerned, there simply weren't enough of them to create sufficient ambiguity in this regard. In fact, that begs another point. If the buyer of the song in our example flips 100 bits, then it will take a wider distribution of the song into the control of individuals in society than it would if he or she flipped 1,000 bits in order to introduce unpredictability in rule of law. <laughs> Read that again. And as far as... No, we're... Well, here we are. In fact, that begs another point. If the buyer of the song in our example flips 100 bits, then it will take a wider distribution of the song into the control of individuals in society than it would if he or she flipped 1,000 bits in order to introduce unpredictability in rule of law. This is why we are able to usually dismiss this subtlety in intellectual property law. Usually it isn't an issue because the distribution into the hands of controllers isn't that extensive or at least it wasn't until the information age. At this point, the subjective material was, quote, freed from its physical media and lived, quote, lived solely in the abstract realm of subjectivity. Rule of law was suborned by, again, technological deregulation. Once again, because existing law unwittingly presumes by dint of the presence of physical media that one can contract over a nullity. Let me read that again, because it's not that they actually explicitly said we're going to contract over the physical media. That's not the point. Rule of law was suborned by technological deregulation once again. Rule of law was suborned by technological deregulation once again because existing law unwittingly presumes by dint of the presence of physical media that one can contract over a nullity. Thus, the equitable solution to this dilemma, and the one that guarantees consistency with rule of law, is to render any point-to-point -point exchange and valuable consideration of intellectual property enforceable under the law. However, one cannot treat any contract for royalty, or any scheme as here described, as an enforceable form of valuable consideration. The only objection we've heard to this, no one seems to be able to challenge it thus far, which is odd, is that a medium always exists even if it's the copper wire over which the song was transmitted, in our example. The problem with this argument, however, is that contract law, once again, is ambiguous, because the song now truly lives in the abstract, since it can be transferred by the end user onto any number of impossibly, uh, impossible to exhaustively identify media, <laughs> perhaps bearing a bit flip modification of thousands of bits. I mean, there's no way to say Finally, we must ask under a fiducial economy how one promotes innovation if the government will not back traditional copyright and patent law. And that's why I don't like this. I don't like this because, um, because of that. And, um, but the logic of it is sound. And, uh, so it's, it's one of those things that, um, you know, it's kind of like a lot of things in law. There's things that um, you can conclude in law with certainty you're pretty sure about, but you don't personally like. Um, 
and this is one of those. I don't really like this, but um, the conclusion is clear. Historically, uh, you know, it's kind of a trap. Historically, people have been set up because before the information age, you know, this all made sense, and then all of a sudden, you know, the rugs pulled out from under them. So anyway, the answer to this is once again due to the due to paradigm, paradigms inhered by generations of conditioning, much simpler than it appears at first. So the answer to this is, once again, due to para paradigms adhered by generations of conditioning, much simpler than it appears at first. If royalties are outlawed, but single sales are not, then the valuable consideration of the point-to-point -point sale is fundamentally altered. And you would have never thought of this if you remained in that older paradigm. This would have never probably occurred to you, is what that's saying. Now the, quote, speculative value of the thing being exchanged experiences an inflection point. For if the value of the thing considered is real, that is, is a real form of wealth, it will have value if in the possession of the right person or entity that can, be put, that can put it to best use. But let's be clear, this isn't really speculation either. It is in fact a genuine valuable consideration for the wealth of a set of abstract ideas generated from a human being's brain we call intellectual property today. In other words, the currency wealth considered at the initial transaction for the abstract ideas offered and rendered legally enforceable under general federalism will, if it be successful, be orders of magnitude greater than it would have been with royalties. This is the important point. You would have never thought of this if you were using the old paradigm. This probably would have never occurred to you. It's the point that's being driven home here. Um, it probably would have never occurred to someone um, in that old paradigm thinking about this problem. That, in other words, the currency considered at the initial transaction for the abstract ideas offered and rendered legally enforceable under general federalism will, if it be successful, be orders of magnitude greater than it would have been with royalties. So it's the, that first point of sale, what it's saying is at that first point of sale, if you don't allow royalties in the first place, and if that really has value, then at the point of sale, it's going to sell for a whole lot more than it did when it had royalties. You're getting the money up front. You're not getting it in royalties is what it's saying. This might be, and it actually makes the transaction really more legitimate because it, there, it does eliminate the possibility of speculation. With intellectual property today, you, had, you do have speculation. Um, but anyway, um, where was I? This might be more evident in the realm of patent law. The running of IP chop shops is a booming industry in the United States. Yes, it is. And consists of investors buying up patents and adhering additional wealth into them by a required process in the United States called reduction to practice. For if a patent isn't, quote, reduced to practice, or in other words, if it isn't actually used, tested, and proven in the market, then it could lose its value or be less valuable to those trading in IP, intellectual property. So organizations form for the sole purpose of purchasing IP rights basically patents, and reducing them to practice, then selling the IP rights to another buyer at a much increased price, because now it's been reduced to practice, it's more valuable. The actual process is much more complicated than that, but yeah, you get the idea. It involves teams of patent attorneys who, by filing lawsuits against already existing infringers upon the IP rights held, can compel the industry to take notice of the IP rights and begin respecting them. <laughs> this is such a scam. So this is because even if one applies for and is granted a patent, it is almost always violated unless attorneys go to court and sue. This should have been in one of our examples of violating rule of law because that's what this is. Um, the rule of law here is completely ignored. Um, I, I mean, blindly, completely ignored. Um, you have to, to enforce patent law in the United States, you have to go to court and sue somebody. It's not a matter of law. <laughs> this further drives the value of the IP up. In any case, the moral hazards inherent in this IP matter are self-evident. Wasteful effort is expended for establishing reduction to practice, which in almost all cases is just abandoned after reduction to practice is approved. Entire corporations are created, wasting millions of dollars in each case, simply to go through a bureaucratic hurdle to enhance the value of the IP held. Then everyone is laid off and the company disappears. Happens all the time. Um, big, a big deal in the software industry. Um, no one, of course, is told about this in advance. And this faux reduction to practice does nothing to actually advance the technology invented. 
The practice is rampant in the United States today. So yeah, they they have a you know this massive enterprise spending millions of dollars to do nothing but um, purporting to actually sell a real product. But that's really not their point. They're just trying to reduce to practice. So in summary, general federalism in terms of its economic aspects includes a legislative body for the determination of what and how much is produced. We, we talked about that. Um, and uh, ecologically speaking, um, how to handle natural resources, which sets the productivity pay scales, which regulates how productivity is defined, and which is a governmental body. Outside government, it calls for a public trust made durable by rule of law in which ownership of all commercial assets lies. This trust belongs to everyone equally and is modified only by fiduciaries um, in only specific ways allowed by the Constitution. A general federation utilizes zero-zero banking, and its only banks are those that print and distribute currency. There are no regular banks in the sense of a normal bank. So zero-zero banking is a novel means of managing currency and circulation and for influencing the creation of wealth. So um, that kind of introduces us to what's going to be in the next section, um, which is now, so we're talking about financial economics, and we've, we've wrapped that up as far as the introduction. And what, what zero banking zero zero banking uh, is, as far as topic is concerned, is it, it's get, it's taking us into the monetary policy, the monetary aspects of the fiducial economy. So it's, it's a slightly different subject, but closely related. Um, and uh, before in the next section, I think we're also going to talk about. Um, we're going to start with sovereignty, and that's important because we've talked about, and this this comes up too. And I don't know if we mentioned that in the beginning about. Uh, good reason for rule of law or why new ideas are needed but if it's not it should be um, but um, basically currency we talked about this how current and I think we'll talk about this in the next section uh, in the zero zero banking currency has to be backed by law it has to be legally tender and uh, rule of law has to back it um, a lot of people out there are promoting uh, various incrementalist approaches to global rule of law and one of the ways in which they're doing it is they're promoting a global currency. But the mistake there is that um, you don't want to try that unless you have global rule of law first, or at least they need to come together. Because a global currency needs to have the backing of a legal system. Um, a reserve currency is not the equivalent. And you can't say that a reserve currency, well, the reserve currency works, you know, but it's not enforceable globally. I mean, it can't be legally backed. The U.S. dollar as a reserve currency can't be legally backed in China. It has no, the U.S. has no control over that, no direct control over that. Um, but that's not really the point. The point is, is that um, in a reserve, in a reserve um, uh, currency, um, it's not. It's that's not the issue. Um, but in a global currency, it certainly is, just like it is in a, in a national economy. If you have a global economy or a global currency that um, can be enforced and must be honored anywhere in the world, if that's the idea behind it, then you've got to back it that way. You can't just say that. Um, you can't just presume that. You have to have a way of backing it. So this is actually a problem the European Union ran into because their currency is not fully backed um, by a central authority. Um, if you actually read the treaties and whatnot that this whole thing's based on, it's all based on, you know, um, you know, everyone please get along and, you know, do what the European Union and the Central Bank ask you to do, the European Central Bank ask you to do, and play nice and be friends. And, um, you know, if you don't do, if you don't cooperate and do what they ask in terms of monetary policy, we'll take names. And that's it. There, there is no enforcement of the currency, no true enforcement. So um, that that that's why sovereignty is important before we talk about zero zero banking because it's important to understand that you know sovereignty and the enforcing of a currency they're you know they're closely related um, unless you have some kind of central authority it's it's impossible to enforce a currency and so you have to have that um, you don't need necessarily have to have a nation state or sovereignty in the traditional sense and uh, we've kind of been over that. Um, as far as how, how general federalism handles incrementalism. General federalism has its own way of handling that. So it has a way of, within rule of law, of enforcing a currency within the federation, even while allowing um, the union with, uh, a union with um, nations that um, still are not uh, fully compliant with federal law. Um, so it's, it's interesting how that works. That's the, that's the codicil we were talking about. So anyway, um, 
that ends it for section 7 of 8, and the next section will be 8 of 8, where we'll talk about a generalized form of strong federalism um, and zero-zero banking. And just to kind of give you a, let's just sort of prefigure things a little bit, um, a strong form of general federalism, what that's saying is, um, and we're going to, I think there's actually a plan to do this, to actually write up a special a constitution for a special federation. The distinction here between general and special is, is that a special federation would be, uh, you know, um, a subsidiarity, right? So when you have a subsidiarity consistent with general federalism, it would be a federal system um, in the same sense that the United States, for example, is a federal system. Um, it'd be at the state level, um, and so that'd be a special federalist system. So general federalists do refer to the United States as a special federalist system, um, a very broken one, but... Um, one that tries to mimic a special federalist system. The term strong is used to refer not really so much to the idea of a strong central power, that's not really what that means, but it means strong federalism in the sense of a Hamiltonian federalist system. Um, Neoliberals are, <laughs> are so upset with uh, strong federalism um, that uh, Hamilton's view of it that they've gone to the lengths of even excising him from from history when they talk about the founding of the United States. It's kind of funny and pathetic at the same time. But, you know, they talk about James Madison, John Jay, and, uh, and of course, Benjamin Franklin. Uh, but they won't even mention Alexander Hamilton anymore because um, because he was a strong Federalist. So, strong Federalist really is um, very consistent with general Federalism because it, what, what, what that really means is that it's sort of the opposite of this hokey, um, you know, populist mentality of Benjamin Franklin. So, no offense to Benjamin Franklin, but um, the point is, um, this goes right back to what we were talking about, about the two kinds of representative government. Um, a populist um, view is the view that the public should be directly involved in the creation of public policy. That is a very populist view, and it is disastrous, and is not durable, and we know this, um, empirically know that for a fact. So the Benjamin Franklin... Uh, form of federalism is not, I would even call it federalism, um, but some people do, some Americans do, or some U.S. Uh, citizens do, um, and uh, it, it's just a populist form of federalism. Uh, Alexander Hamilton was more on the opposite side. He said, well, you know, we've talked about balance of powers between the organs of government, but Hamilton also talked about, which very few people realize, the balancing of powers between um, state and uh, basically the interest of the nation as a whole and faction. So he actually recognized that. He realized that you had to, you also need to balance the powers between faction and, and the, the interest of faction and the interest of the nation as a whole. That is a problem that's been understated and not well understood in the United States. Um, and it's it's the part of the cancer that's eating at neoliberal Western democracy. So I'll stop ranting and we will pick up with part eight of eight. Um, a generalized form of strong federalism and zero-zero banking. Until then, I'll see you later. See you later.